Paganini lived 200 years ago, and he's rightfully considered to be the world's first rock star. <laughs> he um, expanded violin technique to a degree that it had never before. You know, he, he did things that people didn't think were possible. Um, all of these pyrotechnical tricks on the instrument, and in doing so, he also expanded the violin's tone color possibilities and expressive range. Uh, he had long hair, he was tall and gaunt and dressed all in black and had plenty of groupies and so he really had sort of the bad boy lifestyle in a way but um, he also was a, you know, a more complex person than that. He was a, known to be a very generous colleague and uh, obviously with his 24 caprices um, that was his statement as a serious musician. They're, you know, they're, they're plenty technically hard, but they're not just about getting up there and showing off. He dedicated this cycle to all the artists, and there are just some absolutely beautiful melodies. Paganini, we, we must remember, lived at the same time as the great bel canto opera composers like Donizetti, Bellini, Verdi, and Rossini. And Rossini actually said if Paganini were to write opera, he would put the rest of us out of business. And so that's really, you know, how highly those guys thought of Paganini as a composer of melody. And so, you know, while we remember him for his fast flying fingers, which he did better than anybody who ever came before him and still sets the standard 200 years later, on the other hand, you know, all those women weren't swooning at his concerts just because of his fiery playing. You know, he also touched their hearts with the lyrical side of his playing, and I tried to bring out both elements in my new album. I love there was a, a Facebook post on your um, page where you talk about Caprice Number 21 saying it sounds like singers should add words Absolutely. to the uh, to the melody. Uh, can you tell us, uh, for folks who don't know, I mean, bel canto, that means beautiful singing. I mean, what are the what are the uh, the qualities of bel canto that transfer to the violin? Yeah, well, just the virtuosity of, of many fast notes very cleanly, but um, always with, with grace and taste, uh, you know, with a fluidity and um, and sometimes even a delicacy and so you know having a tone quality that's not overly bombastic but that you know always has refinement along with all of the the facile um, jumps and leaps Well, I think when people who know uh, Paganini and know that image of Paganini, it, it perhaps conjures up, you know, the, the ideas that he was in league with the devil, he was a supernatural, <laughs> virtuoso, and it's, ver it's really nice to see you bringing out some of the opposite side and focusing on the, the bel canto. Well, I always laugh about that because, you know, of course people were more superstitious back then, but, you know, that's... <laughs> definitely survived with you know some of the blues guys of the 20th century and some of the rock guys more recently you know this idea that you have to sell your soul to get you know your powers of you know playing your instrument well why shouldn't we get good things from above you yeah. know i like to think that any musical talent that i've been given um, is you know from <laughs> powers for good not evil <laughs> and that of course there's also the element of hard work of plenty of practice hours it's not all supernatural uh, so you know maybe that's just the midwesterner in me but i think it's um you know, really important to to just, you know, develop what you have. And clearly Paganini did that. It must have had a genius for imagination to even um, come up with some of the ideas for what could be done on the violin when nobody before him had done those things. He also had um, was cursed with a disease um, called Marfan syndrome, the same kind that Abraham Lincoln had, mm -hmm. which affects your joints and makes them looser. That's why both of those gentlemen had gaunt looks to their faces right. and of course, it um, affects your internal organs, so it's not a good disease to have. But it did m mean that his hands in their sort of deformity were able to reach things that people couldn't normally reach. And now, of course, we have to play this music with our mere healthy hands and yeah. work extra hard. <laughs> Now, these 24 Caprices, which are more or less the centerpiece of the album, I mean, you have a long history with these works. I mean, it, it goes, your appreciation of it goes all the way back to uh, 
your beginnings as a violinist. Yeah, when I started lessons when I was three, and when I was six, my mom bought an LP recording of Itzhak Perlman's 24 Caprices, and it was my bedtime bribe. If I didn't want to lie down and close my eyes, my mom would say, if you'll just be a good girl, you know, I'll put on your Paganini record. <laughs> so I would lie there in the dark and listen to each Caprice, one after the other, and just think about all of the, the possibilities of what one could do on the violin. And, you know, I was so inspired to practice as much as I could so that I could do all of those things myself one day. Can you talk a little bit about some of the um, challenges of playing these caprices? Because they're, they're also very different, and they each accentuate, you know, a different pyrotechnical or lyrical quality of the violin. Yeah, so you have, you know, the, the mysterious, you know, mood of number six and number two, the the playfulness of the outer sections of 19 and and, uh, and 17, um, you know, the playing on the G string alone in the middle of 19, the, the beautiful vocal arias of 21 and, and 11, and then of course all the different bowing techniques, bouncing bows in 5 and 10 and, and number 1, and um, you know all the crazy double stops with thirds and, <laughs> and finger octaves. And, I mean, the list just goes on. You yeah. have to be pretty well-rounded. Um, and the upo staccato, that was my bane, um, the hardest thing that that I had to learn because I I wasn't born with any natural upo staccato. I had to build it all from scratch as opposed to the ricochet, the bouncing bows. That came to me much more naturally. Ultimately, playing the notes themselves is not the goal. It's it's really the beginning. Once you can play them fast and clean and in tune and um, nail them, then it's like, okay, what do you do with the notes? And making sure that each individual caprice tells a story is so important because if you just play each one in a more you know bombastic, you know flamboyant way, that might be exciting for the first few, but then it all starts to sound the same and it starts to get a bit boring. So you really have to. Um, explore and figure out what makes each one different. Number four is a particularly special one. I think it shows the chamber music side of Paganini's artistry because it's it's in a lot of multiple voice writing. And of course, Paganini is an under-recognized composer of chamber music. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other music on the album? Um, I'm familiar with the uh, the Nel Cor Piel Non Mi Sento uh, variations, but uh, the duet for one and the uh, Caprice d'Adieu I'd never heard before. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about those. Yeah, so my original plan was to do what most people do and record the 24 Caprices on a CD. Uh, and then I realized that you know I wanted to take Paganini as seriously and you treat him with as much respect as I would any other composer from the early 1800s. And if I was recording, you know, Beethoven or Schubert or somebody, I would, um, you know, p- give a lot of credence to the the repeats that they indicate. And Paganini is very specific. Sometimes he wants sections repeated, sometimes he doesn't. So I decided to do all of the repeats that he had indicated because he must have had a good artistic reason for them. And the onus was on me as the interpreter to make sure that I tried to play it interestingly enough to sustain hearing some of the music over again. So I did all the repeats, but that bumped the number of minutes past what would fit on just one album. So all of a sudden I had a double album, and this opened up the possibility of adding a few extra tracks. So Paganini, besides the 24 Caprices, has written just a few other unaccompanied works for violin alone. And um, the Caprice de Dieu is a lovely story. It's certainly not a Caprice like his Caprices. Um, The harmonies are much more conventional, less adventurous than his 24. Um, It's not nearly as technically challenging, though it's certainly a finger twister in its own right. Um, But it's just a a cute little bonbon, really. Uh, But he wrote it um, for a friend of his, the concertmaster of the orchestra in London, uh, who had written six caprices himself and dedicated them to Paganini. And Paganini, as a gesture of thanks, wrote this one other little caprice and dedicated it to his friend. So I think that's that's just such a lovely story, and it's a, it's a sweet piece that, you know, is very fun and catchy.
The duet for one is crazy. This is by far the hardest thing by Paganini that I've ever encountered. It totally blows away, you know, even the 24 caprices, in wow. my opinion. Um, it's written on two staves, even though it's only meant to be played by one musician. And it's supposed to imitate the sound of a violin being accompanied by a guitar. Paganini, of course, of course played both instruments himself. And this was just a crazy idea. The violin plays the melody and then plucks the accompaniment with the fingering hand, with the left hand. Um, so your your left hand fingers, of which there are only four to begin with, one of them is stopping the note, that's the melody note. One of them is stopping the pitch, that's the plucked note. And then the third one is plucking the plucked note at any given time. So it's just like patting your head and rubbing your stomach times a hundred. Um, just the trickiest thing in the world, but... I thought, you know, I'll, I'll dedicate the time to work it up because it would be so cool to include it on the album. And you've got your own little tribute to uh, Paganini there that, that you arranged yourself, right? On, on the New Zealand National Anthem. Yeah, so that's... Uh, Super fun to be able to include my own um, little composition. Paganini, uh, actually the only other unaccompanied piece that he wrote, which I did not include on this album because it didn't fit the Italian vibe with his repertoire that I was going for, but Paganini composed virtuoso variations for solo violin on um, the British national anthem, God Save the Queen. And um, when I was doing my first tour of New Zealand in 2000, I was so inspired by the, the cute kiwi birds and the beautiful landscape and the friendly people. I just really wanted to do an homage to the country, but New Zealand hadn't existed when Paganini was alive, so I thought I would take their national anthem, uh, which is a, a lovely tune, and make some Paganini-style variations on it. But I do something a bit different um, in my pizzicato variation. Instead of having the bow play the melody and the left hand pluck the accompaniment. I actually have both voices play the melody in canon, which is something I hadn't seen in any encore um, that I'd previously encountered. So um, that was that was kind of cool to perhaps expand the range of what the violin could do just a, a little tiny bit um, with my little piece. You're coming out to uh, Toledo in November to play with the symphony, right? That's right. It will be my debut with the Toledo Symphony, so I'm really looking forward to that. Your album, Bel Canto Paganini, out now from Avi Records. Uh, you can find more information at rachelbartonpine.com. We'll link to that from our website. And Rachel, thanks so much for joining us here on FM91. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> 